Hey, brother, how's it going? It's going really well, Harsh. How are you doing? All killer, no filler, my friend. That's what's up. You're back on the 5 a.m. challenge? Back on the 5 a.m. challenge, yes. 15 days through, 15 more to go. And I'm kind of starting to wake up early by myself without needing an alarm. Woke up at 4 today. Wow, okay. The, the thing with my way of life schedule and the businesses I have is that I kind of end up staying up incrementally late and late. So let's say that for this 30 day period, I'm going to start waking up at five, but then slowly I'm going to start sleeping at nine 30, 10, 11, 11, 30, 12, 12, 31, because I tend to push it. I tend to work a little later every single day. And eventually it will get to me sleeping at five (laughs) o'clock and then waking up around noon and then doing another one of these challenges. So when do you determine when you're going to start the challenge? Typically, when I get annoyed by the fact that I'm sleeping at 5 a.m. and waking up at noon, that's when I do a challenge. Okay. Do you have a hard cutoff when you say, at this time, I'm going to stop working? I don't. Typically, I just stop working when I'm exhausted or when the task at hand is done. Sometimes okay. it means that I just don't sleep. In the sense, if I got a lot of stuff to do, I'll just skip asleep and work continuously for a day, two days. And that typically helps get everything in control. Okay. I don't know about for you, man, but whenever I sleep eight hours, I wake up more tired. Anything less than eight hours makes me wake up energized. No, man, this is not the case with me. I love sleeping. If If I sleep 10 hours a day, I feel really, really, really good. You do? You don't feel sluggish? No, I feel amazing. The more I sleep, the better I feel. 12 hours, the best. You take naps? No. You don't take naps. Okay. So I will not sleep that long, but throughout the day, I'll try to take one nap. And my nap lasts for 10 minutes. Because when you nap uncontrollably for very long, then you wake up even more sleepy. But if you hit somewhere around the 10 minute to 20 minute mark, it's the perfect time to wake up feeling energized. It's called cat naps. I have heard of this and I've tried it. But in my experience, if I sleep for 10 minutes, then I just get very sleepy and I want to sleep for at least two hours. Mm, Okay, so naps aren't for you then. I don't know what it is. I've heard that this nap stuff works for a lot of people. Personally, for me, if I want to sleep, I sleep for quite a while. And I actually like to sleep. Some people hate sleeping. They're like, sleeping is bad. Sleeping is for the lazy. I actually like it. It makes me feel really good. And one thing I always look forward to is, you know, when you've gone on a trek or some very physically exerting activity, and then you know you're going to sleep for at least 12 hours. And you feel so amazing after you do that. Yeah, if it's a physically exhausting activity that I did, then I have no problem sleeping in. But if it's just a regular day and I'm sleeping for eight hours, I wake up feeling groggy, man. This time and time again, that's one thing I've noticed. Somewhere around the seven hour mark is perfect for me. But that's not advice for others. Because as we're talking right now, I could tell automatically that we have different body types and different preferences. So learning how to sleep is a thing as well. Because if you're not sleeping correctly and you wake up tired and you're spending your entire day caffeinated, when you drink too much caffeine, you get angrier, quicker by little things, and you just keep repeating this cycle, it could ruin your entire month and the month can be turned into the entire year. So you got to really pin it down. What is the optimal sleep schedule for me? Do you wake up to an alarm? Nah, I haven't set an alarm in two years. Nice. (laughs) Do you? I've been doing the 5 a.m. challenge. So yes, I use an alarm now. But Mm -hmm. usually I just sleep as much as I want. My body automatically wakes up at a certain time. For example, even if I sleep in late, let's say I sleep in at 2 in the morning, my body is still going to wake up max at 6.45 a.m. We have very different bodies, my friend. I will sleep as long as I need. Yeah, I can't sleep up until the afternoon. That was something I could do in college, 
But nowadays, since I've been doing the 5 a.m. challenge for so long, I'm pretty sure my nervous system got reconditioned to wake up early in the morning. You know, what I found works really, really well when it comes to waking up early is just mm. keeping your alarm far away from your bed. Because mm. now you're forced this, to turn it off. Yeah, you have to wake up and stand up and then turn it off. A lot of people keep trying to wake up at 5 o'clock, but they can't wake up at 5 o'clock because every time they wake up at 5 o'clock, they just press the snooze button, like snooze, snooze. Mm-hmm. Like how are you actually waking up at 5 if you're going to press the snooze button? The simple solution is to just keep your phone somewhere far away that you have to get up to turn it off. Every employee has a story of a time when they kept clicking snooze, snooze, snooze. And then the third time they hit snooze, they woke up two hours later. Their job already started. And they're thinking, oh, no, how am I going to tell my boss? Because with sleeping, I mean... It feels as though you're sleeping for 10 seconds and suddenly an hour has passed. It's like the concept of time doesn't exist when you're li- lightly, yeah, lightly sleeping. How it's happened many times. I wonder if sleep is a form of time travel in the sense that for your brain, time literally doesn't exist when you're asleep. Probably. Because there was this one time we were doing this road trip and I, I was just doing this for a little bit, right? I thought I was just closing my eyes. And then I wake, I open my eyes and we're at the destination. And I asked my brother, hey, how long was I closing my eyes for? He said, for three hours. Three <laughs> hours? I thought I literally was just closing my eyes for 10 minutes. It's like time did not exist. Do you remember when you were a kid? You could fall asleep in the car and wake up on your bed. Yeah, I remember those days. Good stuff, my friend. Good stuff. Unless you're a fat ass and your parents won't wake you up. <laughs> hey, get up. I'm not carrying your ass. <laughs> you know, I was reading a sentence on Instagram or Twitter a couple of days ago that one day your parents picked you up and kept you down. And that was the last time they picked you up. Mm-hmm. Did you ever have to step on your parents' back? No. I mean, I don't remember. That? Probably. Do you mean step on in the sense to get something or just as just for fun? No, because their back was sore. So they, they would tell you to step oh, on Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've done that, yes. Have you? Okay. Because I remember you were a fat growing up. So they probably said, no, no, you don't have to do it. <laughs> Ask one of your siblings. That's what happened with me and my brother. So my brother gained a lot of weight. I would always have to step on their back. They're like to my brother. <laughs> no, no, no. You, you keep watching TV. <laughs> We're so not I ready watch for TV you too. yet. <laughs> <laughs> because when a little kid steps on your back, initially I was thinking, okay, what am I exactly doing? But from the perspective of a parent, they're getting all their muscles hit uh, with my feet. Because my feet is angled in a certain way that could tackle muscles that one of those massage machines can't. So I see some method behind the madness. I think that a lot of people mistreat their back so much that over time it degrades quite a bit. Everybody's Mm -hmm. back is going to get hurt and degrade over time. This is a fact of life. And it has to do with the fact that we evolved from fish. Have you seen a fish's spine? It's it's somewhat similar to ours. It kind of has those, you know, scale, you know, those lines in the vertebrae. Mm-hmm. And a fish lives in water. That means that it's floating inside the water. It doesn't have pressure on the spine. And the spine kind of moves left and right, what have you. But there's no gravity pressure on the spine itself and that's the environment the spine evolved in and then when the fish evolved into say monkeys or lizards or what have you that spine was placed parallel to the ground under four limbs so it had sheer force applied to it that is the back the middle part of the spine is a bit raised and it's being pulled down by gravity Mm -hmm. from the long side of the spine downwards 
and in a bipedal creature the spine is orthogonal to the ground not parallel to the ground in this case the spine is being compressed so we don't have shear pressure the shear stress on our spine isn't there but we have compression stress and with compression stress over time you know there are discs in your spine which separate mm-hmm. out these vertebra so l1 l2 all of these vertebra and there's a disc in the middle which i don't know what it's made out of but it kind of contains some fluid and these discs will compress and degrade over time simply as a mechanical thing the spine did not evolve in a way that it was it was supposed to be under constant pressure of gravity but here we are we evolved with what we had and our spines get worse with time the whole thing about massaging your muscles it does help you but the reason why a lot of people's spines are so bad is because they never took care to strengthen their back they don't deadlift or pull do pull ups or anything to make their back stronger and they just sit all day and stand all day and you know do some kind of stupid work like type all day and all that contributes to making your already degrading spine degrade even faster interesting does the bed that you sleep on also play a role it does play a role yes if you have a very soft bed right then mm-hmm. your spine will curve in the bed and that's not good for you so prefer to have a firmer mattress sleeping on the floor is the best do you ever sleep on the everybody. floor yeah i sleep on the floor normally or when you're trekking no no i've been sleeping on the floor for a few months now what it's very good for health but mm-hmm. i've been doing it for productivity reasons in the sense that describe it describe it is there are you sleeping raw on the floor or is there a blanket you know what a chadar is yeah i know what it is but how do, how are we going to describe that for the americans or english it's a sheet of cloth it's like it's like a bed sheet mm-hmm. it's thinner than a blanket it's thinner than a blanket it's like a layer mm-hmm. of cloth a single right. or double layer of cloth mm-hmm. you put it on the ground you have a pillow and then you just sleep on the floor and, and you the still reason, have your bed right i still have my bed yes the bed is not used for other things i bet <laughs> <laughs> but yes i sleep on the floor i've been doing it for a few months it's been very beneficial but it's temporary what made you get into it and why is it temporary The reason I got into it was super simple. I wanted to be much more productive and I was finding that ever since I moved into this newer house I was telling you about it has way too many amenities like you press a button hot water comes out and it was making my life far too comfortable to the point where it was taking away some of my motivation to actually put in the work. You mm-hmm. know how it is right if you can just relax all day you don't want to do anything. Right. So just to make Absolutely. my life a little exactly right. just to make my life a bit harder i started sleeping on the floor and it it's been very useful for me that's good and why are you making it temporary then at some point i'm going to get married and i don't think i'm going to let the woman sleep on the floor with me <laughs> it, it's a deal breaker if she doesn't want to sleep on the floor with you that's your second date second day deal breaker like, would you be willing to sleep on the floor she's like what <laughs> Man. What about you? I sleep in a bed, bro. I sleep in a queen uh, bed. Uh I used to which sleep queen? like a queen-size mattress. No, but which queen? Which queen? Uh, <laughs> oh, I thought you were asking me for the name of my bed. I do not know. But before that, No, I'm asking you which queen's bed are you sleeping on? No, oh, yeah, I don't know. But before that, I was um sleeping in these very tiny beds. So I don't think you've ever stayed in a hostel or a college dorm, but for those folks who did, uh, you sleep in these tiny little beds and my foot, my feet would actually go over the bed. That's how tiny these were. And I would sleep on those for years, even to this day. Whenever I visit my parents, I'm sleeping in these tiny little beds that used to be bunk beds. And for some reason, I sleep like a baby. But a few years back I thought okay let me try to get a better sleeping experience uh, let me make it bigger 
and I, I got the queen size mattress then. But for a long time, I used to be sleeping in these tiny little beds. And even before that, dude, I didn't have the whole frame. I literally just had the mattress and that was it. Have you ever slept on the floor? Yeah, I've slept on the floor plenty of times. Um, whether I was doing a road trip and one of my friends let me stay at their place, uh, they would just let me sleep on the floor because already their apartments are very tiny. I slept on the floor a couple of times when I was moving from one house to another here, and we were still waiting to move our beds. I slept on the floor a couple of times, but it's not something that I would willingly introduce into my life for productivity's sake at this point. Um, I have different methods to make life very difficult, uh, but sleeping is something that I already don't do enough. So when I'm going to do it, I want it to be enjoyable. Man, sleeping on the floor is actually pretty, pretty good. Mm -hmm. I sleep better on the floor than on the bed. Do you? Was there an Maybe... adjustment period? No, I just started sleeping on the floor and that's it. So to be honest with you, the reason I started sleeping on the floor was... Do you remember I told you I'm studying computer science? Mm -hmm. The thing is, I have three courses left. Well, two and a half courses left. But I have so much work going on with my businesses and the new company I'm building, RepurposeFi.com, which incidentally hit $1,000 MRR in 40 days, two days ago. Wow, congratulations. And it's not even launched yet. Yeah, I mean, we hit 1K MRR without launching. People were just like reaching out to us. Hey, can I be an early adopter? Can I use the software before other people? I'm like, sure. Nice. Has it been difficult but, to keep up with demand? Sort of. We are still building our user interface, which means some of the work is still being done manually. So serving all these customers does take some time, but we are happy to have them. Very grateful. And yeah, the software, people seem to like it quite a bit. But the point is that I just wasn't finding any time whatsoever to study the whole computer science thing. So my idea was, until I finish computer science, I'm going to sleep on the floor. Okay. And it's been a few months, you said. Are there it's any been other... a few months. Mm -hmm. Are there any other things that you're doing to make your life more difficult? So thus far, we've said 5 a.m. challenge and sleeping on the floor. 5 a.m. challenge, sleeping on the floor, and no hot water to you no know, bathe. Like I bathe in normal temperature water now. Normal, not cold? You don't get cold temperature water where I live right now. Unless I was to add ice or something to it, it's mm -hmm. normal temperature. Gotcha. Anything else? Do you count the gym? You know, gym is like bl brushing teeth, you know, it's not an achievement. It's okay. something I would say, if you're not doing, then like not taking care of yourself. Right. What about you? You said that you do quite a few things to make your life harder. I mean, for me, um, I, I mean, the whole eating one time a thing, um, I would say for most folks, if you tell them that, they'll say, wow. Some would actually say that's stranger than sleeping on the floor. Especially when I bring it up, they're like, what? You know, they look at me like I have three heads. So I would say that's one. Um, I don't do any sweets. I don't drink any sodas. Um, I, when I work, I work a lot. Uh, you know the Pomodoro technique, how they typically say 30 minutes to uh, 30 minutes of work, 10 minutes of break. Mm -hmm. I do a few hours of work and a couple of <laughs> minutes of break. So th there are different mental exercises. I consider this a mental exercise as well because we're talking without any breaks for a long duration of time. So different ways to exercise concentration. What else? I don't in think fact, in your case, this is harder because you're on camera. So you have to sit straight all the time. You yeah, can't you be like sit... me, like relaxing on the back. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes, man, th this is difficult because... What happens if you watch most podcasts is that there's different camera angles, right? So let's say it's Joe Rogan experience. He is not having the camera on him the entire time. So every now and then when the camera goes over to his guests, he can just relax for a little bit. Then he can get back in position. But since I only have one camera in front of me, I don't have different angles to work with. So this is another way where your mind cannot only be present but your body has to be present as well. So I consider this somewhat of a, a difficult activity. And there's a couple Work of hard. other things. As, yeah, there's a couple of other things. I don't do cold shower. I do dark showers. I think I told you about that. 
right? Now, what's a dark shower? So I, I shower with the lights off. No light enters at all because I don't have one of those gradient windows by my shower area. So when I turn the lights off, it is purely off. And this is the exact opposite of a cold shower. Where a cold shower is quick and intense, a dark shower is relaxing and drawn out. And during these moments, I have a lot of great ideas. Um, my senses are pretty much shut off, so I'm only alone with my mind. And it gives me a lot of ideas for uh, YouTube videos, blogs, books, much more. So it's a part of my ritual at this point. The dark showers. The dark shower. <laughs> there was a guy that... This is the I, first time I've heard of this. Yeah, I stumbled into it by accident because one time I woke up and um, there was an outage in my neighborhood. So electricity, everything was out. So I was burning, right? The AC was off and it was hot. I thought, okay, if the electricity is off, does that mean the water is off too? I tried to turn on the water and it turned on. So I said, okay, I mean, I can't sleep in this hot weather. How about I take a shower? So when I took a shower in pure darkness, dude, immediately I knew that this was going to be a part of my ritual. I don't recommend this as life advice for anyone, but the few folks that have tried it out, they said that it's a different type of feeling. They can't quite explain it, but it's had a positive impact on their life. They'll do it right before a high pressure speech. They'll do it whenever they're struggling with ideas. Uh, they'll do it whenever they're feeling very anxious. And just by being in that setting, with your senses cut off and just you in pure darkness, something about it, it's a good feeling. I tried the cold shower thing for a staggering three days and I said, no, nah, man, not it. I'm not doing that. Interesting. Yeah. Dark showers. Dark showers. Do you have like one of those windows by your uh, shower area? Not the see-through windows, but one of those blurred out windows? Yeah, yeah, the translucent glass thing, right? Right. So for folks like that, it's best to take the shower at the night if you want the dark shower experience. To be fairly honest with you, I just want to get done with the shower as soon as I can. <laughs> okay, so you don't take a long shower, right? I try to avoid it, you know, maybe like two minutes max done. Okay, my one is at least 20 minutes. Oh, 20 minute long shower, nice. Mm-hmm. It's true that the man. environmentalists hear you, though. Yeah. The environmentalists will always freak out about something. They like freaking out. I'm not even right. joking. They freak out about the stupidest things. Right. So if you, if you bend your knee to one of their demands, they're going to have a, a huge list. Or they're going to say, well, what about these? And now you're living like a bum at this point, just to appease <laughs> these folks that you've never met before. I have a little sister. She's 12 years old. You and do? yeah, me not 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 a blood sister. She is a cousin sister, and okay. in her house, right, her mom and dad kind of listen to her environmentalist nonsense. The twelve year old girl. I don't know why you're taking it seriously, but they are. And mm -hmm. in their house, you can't find tissue paper. You, the the toothbrushes are made out of bamboo and not, you know, plastic like everybody else. And they conserve water and they carry the you know they carry like a jute bag here and there they don't take plastic bags right and when she's with me you know she kind of tries to enforce these laws on everybody and i'm like sister like you're 12 years old shut up and eat this <laughs> and throw away the wrapper you got it in wherever you want in the dustbin of course but don't overthink the stuff and she was like no 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 Harsh, this is bad for the environment. And I'm like, okay, here it is. I'm going to order three of those fries that you just ordered. And I'm going to put them in the dustbin in front of you. And there's nothing you can do about it. Ignore the thing. It's my money. It's my fries. I'm going to put them in the dustbin along with the wrapper. And that's it. So I did that like two, three times. And after that, she's relaxed a bit about the environment thing. I think that a lot of these people are like kids. And because they kind of get some authority by adults, and people who kind of they're around, you know, like the mother and father of this girl. Mm -hmm. That's why they become like this. You know, they're like, this is bad for the environment. You can't do this. You can't do that. Shut up. I'm going to do what I want. Right. And you do it. You kind of 
teach them that a few times and then they also become a bit relaxed and now she isn't too finicky about using a piece of tissue paper would you date a girl like that i can fix most girls tissues like this i don't give a shit most people are too what the word too nice to the cyber stuff i don't care right like if the girl is like the, the plastic bag is bad for you like i know it's bad for me i don't give a shit mm-hmm. like it's hurting the environment let it <laughs> out of curiosity because you were just talking about interacting with a 12 year old cousin when you are interacting with girls uh, more specifically younger uh, relatives do you have a soft side to you or are you always this intense guy on life math money so when i say i'm intense or soft i'm always charming i'm not i'm not being an asshole i'm not being like a mood killer i'm not being like shut up i'm going to throw this in the g- garbage and there is nothing you can do about it i'm not like that right right you have shut the playfulness gonna, to you 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 always have to be playful otherwise you're just an asshole right you have to be like shut up i'm going to throw this in the garbage and let's see you try to stop me and then i'm dangling it in the garbage while they're trying to catch it <laughs> 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 so you always have to be playful so it's not taken in a hurtful way what about when you see a baby do you ever do the baby babble with them baby. I love babies. Okay, so you you play with them. I play with babies. I can play with babies for hours. I just they're so cute and innocent. I like toddlers, babies and no 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 kids. Do babies like you? Babies love me. Okay, same man. A lot of times babies will be crying. Let's say I'm waiting in a place and the baby will be crying. As soon as I sit down, the baby just starts looking at me like <laughs> and it just starts busting out laughing and, and it's such a cute thing and the mom looks at me like thank you because the baby was crying for a really long time and you just just existed and the baby stopped crying babies and dogs dogs will just go out of their way to lick me i don't know what this means do you know what that means i have some guesses but i won't get into it <laughs> do dogs like you bitches love arman <laughs> <laughs> do dogs try to lick you they, i think they'll try to lick everybody but the most just they mostly just smell me and go away they don't like my dogs don't maybe. lick everyone bro with certain people dogs just bark at viciously but other times dogs will just chill relax and sniff their balls and if they sniff your balls that means they trust you that's what i've been told <laughs> Man, the whole wagging tail thing is an important indicator. I have a friend who's afraid of dogs, and I was telling him, "Dude, just have a look at the tail. If the tail is wagging, you have nothing to worry about, even if it's barking." Right. So if a dog's tail wags, that means they're in a good mood. If a cat's tail wags, that means they're in a bad mood. Just a fun fact. I mean, I've never heard of anybody be concerned about a cat. I mean what can it even do it's like a small thing you kick it off if it's bothering you too much or something it's scratch you man have you ever been attacked by a cat that's never happened to me it's happened to me man oh is it man that's interesting well i wasn't attacked but one of my relatives ended up getting a cat and he's saying hey we're talking about it. the animal cat right and not a chick right <laughs> right her <laughs> it's just like just pet it pet it it's not going to do anything i pet it and it scratches me and i'm bleeding and that was my first ever interaction with a cat so for the most part though cats run away so you don't even have time to be scared of it but certain cats are bold they'll just stare at you like come at me i dare you i ain't running away you will see certain stray cats they got a little thug in them is it interesting yeah with dogs huh. though um you never got chased by a dog or bitten by a dog i have never been bitten by a dog thankfully but i used to be afraid of dogs as a kid because i got chased by one but then i'm like why am i afraid of dogs there's these dorks and women who are not afraid of do- dogs so why should i be right so then i stopped being afraid of dogs basically just overnight or was it exposure therapy it was literally overnight i'm like there's women who are not afraid of dogs So why am I afraid of dogs? It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> okay. 
I mean, if a dog is going to attack somebody, that girl has much less chances than me. The fear of dogs is known as sinophobia. That means you used to be sinophobic. Isn't sino supposed to mean China? C Y N O. Oh, okay. C Y N O. Mm-hmm. S I N O is supposed to mean China, right? Possibly. And this is There's... sino India relations. China India relations. There's so many different phobias. There's the fear of spiders, fear of public speaking, fear of dogs. Do you have a fear? I conquered most of the ones I used to have as a child. Like I used to be afraid of getting injections or getting my blood drawn. What about? And now? I'm not afraid of that anymore. No, I don't care about that. I don't like it. Obviously, I would prefer not to have to get it done whenever I do have to get it done. But I'm not scared of it anymore. I used to be afraid of dental work. I'm not afraid of that anymore. Used to be afraid of dogs. Not anymore. Heights. I no never had enough fear of heights. I never had all these common fears outside of these three things: heights, talking to anybody. Never I was never shy at all. So yeah, that type of stuff never really got into me. Thinking of fears, what other fears do I have? Oh yeah, I do fear getting electrocuted. I don't know why. It seems like something a bit scary to me. No. So if I'm doing any sort of crime that warrants that, or am I what? talking to a serial killer right now? <laughs> no, that's that's how serial killers uh, get killed. They get electrocuted. So I was asking, oh, is her, did you did you do some sort of crime that I should be worried about? No, 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 no. I mean, if I did, I would not tell you. <laughs> In India, I think we hang them. We don't use electricity. You guys hang them? To... Yeah, we hang them. Did you ever Wait see someone bit? get hanged? No, man. It's not publicly done. Wasn't the video of Saddam Hussein getting killed uh, made? I- I'm pretty sure uh, that he-, he got hung, and the video of him getting killed was made public. I don't know if it's still public, but around the 2006 era you could get your hands on that video man i've seen a bunch of these videos by cartels and everybody and they are not pretty sometimes they do crazy shit like peeling a guy's face off ah oh, dude bro i don't i want i want to hear all that <laughs> <laughs> yeah some of it is actually very very fucked up i don't know what these cartels are doing or why they're doing it i mean if right. you want to kill someone just kill them like why are you peeling their face off and asking them for water and what the fuck for power man because they want to be feared it's not just about doing the act they want to be feared so people don't even want to challenge them i'm just glad i'm not anywhere near mexico yeah i heard the cartel is very huge in mexico um you guys don't have much gangs there right not really not that much i mean there are certain states which do have some gang violence we do have some of these communist parties here and there which tend to attack the military every once in a while but not organized crime i mean it is there but it's not nearly as brazen as a goddamn cartel mhm and typically these organized criminals they don't bother civilians unless there is some reason to in the sense that maybe 30 years ago right an organized crime people they would come to your shop and be like give me money give me protection money or something but lately a lot of organized crimes have moved into legitimate businesses a lot of hotels and gambling places and bars and restaurants are invested in or partially owned by organized criminals and that is their source of income now i see that's how um breaking bad worked where the guy when he was making all that money um to not arouse any suspicion he bought a car washing place and he would just launder the money through there Yeah but that is different he, this guy like, laundering money is where you're earning money illegally and then lo- washing it through these channels mm-hmm. what i mean is that the mafia in india owns these legitimate businesses as a source of revenue by itself ah i see so That's they made smart. however they made the money they've bought all the land and they've built this hotel on it and now they make money from the hotel and not by going around and give me a protection money i'm sure that still does happen but it's much much less than it used to be i mean the protection money that's such a beginner's way to do it as well what you're describing and now is an operation but when you're just going up to these frail guys that barely are successful business owners themselves and you're saying hey give me a cut 
that's such a novice way to do things. So at least these cartels are leveling up their operation. It depends on who is doing it, right? When people think of mafia, right? Mm-hmm. They think of some kind of big organized operation, which sometimes it is. But sometimes it could just be like one goon with five of his friends. Right. Like the local goon with five of his friends and in his area, all the shops have to give him some money. For example, there's a goon I know. And this guy's source of income is parking tickets in the sense that he controls a long street in which a lot of cars need to park every day. And he mm-hmm. charges like a dollar to park there for a couple of hours. And that's his source of income. Him and his other friends, they just roam the street. And if you want to park, it's a pay and park, even though it's a public street. To park there, you have to pay this guy. He gives you a slip and that's how he makes his money. Okay. So he literally just got a piece of land and how he's charging people. Yeah, he literally park on just that owns this road mm-hmm. or controls this road. And there's nothing you can do about it because what can you do? Let's say that you don't pay him. You come back, all four of your tires have been punctured. Yeah. I saw that happen in a very small scale recently where I went to this one restaurant and the restaurant's parking is packed. So you have to go next door and you have to park at the gas station. So I park at the gas station and this Indian uncle comes to me and says, that will be $20. I said, what? Uh, What are you talking about? He said, you're parking on my land, so it will be $20. I said, man, I'm not going to pay you. I don't even know you're working here. He's like, okay, I will call the tow truck company. I paid this fucker 20 bucks and then I went to the (laughs) restaurant. So some guys, man, that's such an easy way to make income too. You don't do anything. You just charge people to park on your land. And people don't even park for that long. They just park for 20 minutes and go away. Because mm-hmm. getting towed sucks. Have you ever gotten towed before? No. Man, getting towed sucks, dude. Because it's just a... And speaking of, uh, another sort of way to... I want to say it's easy to make income this way, but if you run a tow truck company, man, you are pretty much just grabbing other people's property, putting it onto your land, and charging them to get their property back. And some of these tow truck guys, man, they get guns pulled on them. So you can't be this frail-looking tow truck driver. you got to be somewhat intimidating because when you're taking someone's car, you will see their primal side. Um, so getting towed sucks. Man, in the USA, it looks like everything you do, you risk getting killed. You arrest a criminal. The criminal might shoot you. You take someone's car, they might shoot you. Anything well, they're happens, not gonna, they're, they're not gonna worry sh- about getting shot. Yeah, I mean, but you're taking someone's property. I mean, I, I wouldn't say that justifies getting shot, but and not that you will get shot, but chances are you may get punched in the face at least if you're rude about it too. Now, 85% of folks are going to say, dang, I shouldn't have parked at this illegal spot. All right, go ahead, tow my car away. I'll meet you there shortly with the $200 to get my car back. But 5% of the folks, they're going to say, no, drop my car right now. Otherwise, I'm going to punch you. And they punch the guy. Now, 1% may kill, but uh, I wouldn't say that's the norm. Still, though, I mean, it's a risky thing. Like, imagine your wife, our yeah. man is going out to collect cars for his government job, making sure everyone's parking correctly. And his wife has to wonder, will my husband return today? I hope no one yeah, shoots. I, yeah, I don't think it's that <laughs> dramatic, but I, I see where you're coming from. Man, I've seen... You got to sweet talk these guys where... I don't know if this is true, so don't try it out, but if they're towing your car and you get in the car once they pulled it up, apparently they cannot drive, legally speaking. So sometimes the folks will jump in the car and not get out until the tow truck guy drops the car. I don't know about the accuracy of this. I tried this at your own discretion. Uh, another thing to do just some, is to sweet talk them. One time I went to uh, drop something off, and by the time I'm coming back, I see that my car is being towed. And I look at the guy and say, come on, man. I literally just went for 30 seconds. Can you please help me out? I'm struggling with money right now. I wasn't struggling with money then, but he's just like, oh man, <laughs> he's like, oh, okay, okay, okay. Thank you, man. Thank you for at least speaking to me like a person. People normally just yell at me. I said, all right, man. Uh, yep. Uh, and once he dropped the car, we went about our days. 
So sometimes kindness can kill with these sort of situations. But overall, when you get towed, number one, you feel fear because you think someone stole your car. You have no clue that you got towed. You just see that your car is not where you initially parked it. So number two, as you're freaking out, you're thinking, should I call 911? Someone comes by and says, "Mm, I think you should try the tow truck company first. You call one, two, three tow truck companies. And then one guy says, yeah, I have your car. Um, It'll be $200 cash. Okay. So you can't use debit card. You have to do cash. And now you have to say, okay, well, how the heck am I going to get cash? I have to find, uh, nowadays Uber exists. So it's not that difficult, but before now you have to call a buddy, go to a bank, get cash, go. So it's a process. Can't you just bribe the guy? You could bribe the guy. That's actually another thing where some people will say, um, it was 200 bucks, man. I mean, what are you going to bribe the guy for 200 bucks for? I mean, just give him like a 20 yourself. Be like, I mean, the 200 bucks is a fine for the government, right? A lot of these are not government guys, dude. These are independent guys. Um, and some of these tow truck guys are scumbags. Where if they see that you have a very nice car, then instead of charging you 200, they'll charge you 700. Wait, what do you mean they charge you? As you, I thought this was like a government charge. How no, can a man. private so, company charge you? A private company could just charge you. So let's say you. How can start... a private company take your car? Here's how it works. So let's say Harsh starts a tow truck business, right? He's going to get clientele at apartment complexes. So apartment complexes will tell people, hey, do not park here. If you park here, you will get towed. If someone parks there, they will call Harsh's tow truck company. Now Harsh will come and tow their truck, uh, their car, and now they have to pay Harsh. Oh, they have to pay? What? That's that's not how it works here. For example, here, if you call a private tow truck company, the person who called is supposed to pay because you're the one who is hiring the service. Because what are you going to do? For example, let's say that I tow your car as a private company. You just go to the police and say, you know, Harsh stole my car. No, but the, police, told, but the police will say, did you park somewhere illegally? So if you park somewhere I don't illegally, know, maybe, but yeah, yeah they're going to say, park illegally with, you stole my car without asking me. That's a theft. Yeah. So they're not going to just tow you for no reason. Like if I park in my neighborhood parking lot, they're not going to just come tow me and then say, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. See, this guy yeah. does not have any legal authority to take your car, even if it's parked illegally, at least in India. Okay. You can't just take well, someone's car away and be like, you got to pay me if you put a car back. That's not how it works here. See, well, now you're starting to understand why people are so furious with tow truck companies. But but I do understand the business the, to play um, on their side. I, I do get the business side of it. Uh, and I do it think there are... It needs to be some, some kind of government charge where the money goes to the government and not to the company. The company needs to get a standard fee, $10, $20 for whatever per tow they do. Mm-hmm. That has to come from the apartment complex and the actual, you know, fine needs to go to the government. Right. The store company shouldn't be getting rich off of some kind of fine they made up because here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to charge you $2,000 for your car. What are you going to do about it? You can't do anything, man. And that's the thing where, and I know a guy that owns a tow truck company and he told me the business side of it, where that's just one of their services where they partner with apartment complexes, bowling alleys, malls, and they'll t- tow truck. Uh, cars that were parked illegally. That's one of their services. Another reason to get your car towed is let's say your car stopped working in the middle of the road. You'll call one of the companies and that's still you getting towed, but you're getting towed for a different reason. And other services they provide is let's say you get a flat tire in your car and you don't know how to change your tire. They'll come and change it for you. That's another service. Uh, Let's say your car battery stops working. They'll come and charge it for you. So these tow truck companies have multiple streams of revenue. It's not just towing the truck uh, and cars. They'll provide other services as well. Um, these guys all have a look to them too. They have this macho look. So the guy that I knew, he was he had a tow truck company in Virginia. And some of these guys can easily create a monopoly where they own a tow truck company in each major district. So you could easily build an empire with tow truck companies if you understand the business side of it. But understand that you, every now and then, are going to have a very furious person possibly trying to punch you. 
if not shoot you man the way you're describing it if it's an actual private company they're setting their own fines it's basically car theft in my mm. opinion because that yeah. is completely crazy that's fucking insane if someone takes my car and it gets scratched you're paying for that shit oh yeah a lot of the times it gets scratched man a lot of the times these guys steal the change within uh, the little compartments shady stuff it reminds me of a funny story actually i'll give you some context so two people in india they have government authority to tow cars and the fine goes to the government not to the tow company but the tow company the, these tow people they they will typically not pick up expensive cars because expensive car, car owners might fuck with them really horribly where they might say hey my car got thrashed or the scratch you added on my car and now you got to pay us this much money to fix it because my car was new and you scratched it and mm-hmm. it's hassle they don't want so they typically don't tow these expensive cars i, I was telling you about this goon i know right who owns a street and he mm-hmm. charges people to park on the street well one time this was back when i was in consulting now my family runs a consulting operation one of our clients a lot of our clients are into politics but this one guy is an mla which means a member of legislative assembly and this guy comes in with his car and for some reason he's here without security and he just parks in the street he doesn't pay the tax no <laughs> he doesn't pay the go in the toll money because he's like i'm an mla i'm not paying you this illegal bullshit and right. he gets into an argument with this goon and the goon the, the guy knows this goon this guy he knows that this guy This guy's car is like expensive. So probably he is a somebody, he's not a nobody. And the goon he just accepts it. Okay, fine. You know what? Don't pay me a dollar. It's not going to impact me so much. <laughs> And then after he leaves, you know, after this client of ours goes away, I'm coming out of the office and the guy's asking, "So so who 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 was that guy? He didn't even want to pay a dollar." Like, dude, before you pick fights, you got to know whom you're fighting with. That guy is an MLA. If you pick a fight with him or you puncture his car, this is between you and him. I am not involved. <laughs> What can the MLA do? Well, depending on the situation, a lot of things because he could get you arrested, he could even get you killed. You just don't know, right? Okay. And MLA, it's a legal position. You can think of it as a senator in your I country. See. Okay. makes sense so he has like, power he has power yes and like if you guys have a fight i'm not involved here brother <laughs> arsh has my back <laughs> <laughs> i mean for your dollar you're picking a fight with an mla of like for for a dollar of parking just relax dude it's fine you got to know always who you're stirring up drama with because you think it's just going to be a conflict right now but if it's with the wrong person they can make your life a nightmare for years i mean most people even these mla types right they don't want all this nonsense in their life and typically they will not fight with you too much about it but if you are being too dramatic and you make it an ego issue right once something becomes an ego issue people tend to be a little what's the word for it they will go the extra mile to fuck with you Mm-hmm. you know once you hurt your ego right so this guy this goon guy is like for a dollar he's fighting with this poor guy who doesn't want to pay a dollar to park there and like these both these people are going to just create nonsense in their life over a dollar just relax it's fine that's all it's it is it's not your street it's a dollar it's a dollar for parking that's not it's actually less than a dollar because it's a dollar now back then it used to be 35 rupees which was half a dollar yes okay but th- these are for daily parking right not for big events this is for like you know car for a couple of hours come back type of thing oh yeah then a dollar to 10 dollars is fine this is why it's very important where you also live where one time my chicago coworkers came to florida and they were shocked they said You guys get to you guys have a parking lot that you could park at? I said, "Yeah, you don't." <laughs> and they said, "No, we have to park in one of these lots you're talking about or one of these a solo parking spots, and sometimes that's not even guaranteed." 
So you're basically not sure where you're going to be parking uh, for certain situations. It's freezing, it's cold. And that's when I'm just looking at it and saying, why would you live there? Why would you live in a place where it's cold and it's crowded and you're not guaranteed parking? I have Location asked this question now. to a lot of people who live in the UK, but they don't give me serious answers. Like my what did they normally say? Here. My family lives here. But that's, that's the case with a lot of these North European countries, right? Where it's very cold. Why would someone live in Canada? The temperatures there are insane. Like why? Every time you hear of Indians moving to Canada, I'm like, have you been there before? It's so cold there. I don't know why you would want to voluntarily live there. One of my Canadian friends said a lot of Indians live there. Or there are certain, Indians live there. Yeah, there are certain districts where it actually feels like India. I've seen videos of people on bus stands and it's like 50 Indians and one white chick. Man, if you ever go to New York, there's a place called Jackson Heights where if you go, it's literally like Bangladesh. Even the store signs, it's in Bangla. Everyone's speaking Bangla. So it's like a little Bangladesh in New York Bangla City. Town. Yeah. They also have Chinatown. I think they have a thing called Little Italy. So if enough of your people come to the US, you can set up shop and it'll create a feeling of the motherland. I just don't like crowded places, man, where I don't mind visiting there, but me living there, that's a completely different ball game. Me bumping shoulder to shoulder, riding a subway, not being guaranteed parking, and to make it worse, it's cold. <laughs> I can't I can't handle cold, dude. Define you like cold, cold right? because define cold. That's what I'm saying. Because the way I define cold is the way these UK people define summer. Because for me, oh, cold is 15 to 20 degrees Celsius. That's, that's cold. That's no, some cold. of these places are negative 6.6 yeah, fuck that shit, bro. Celsius. Um, when I lived in Virginia, one time it was negative 8.89 Celsius, which is 16 degrees Fahrenheit. And bro, I was in the elevator in this insulated building and I was still freezing. And now I'm supposed to start an eight-hour shift while freezing. People in the cold, man, they actually, a lot of them get depressed more. I think there's a phrase for it. It's called. Hold on. You need to supplement vitamin D. It's called seasonal affective disorder. Interesting. Where, mm -hmm, where depending on your climate, you're getting less sunlight. And since you're getting less sunlight, you're prone to more fatigue, depression, hopelessness, social withdrawal. That's what it is writes here. That doesn't seem like a life I want. So why the hell am I going to live in a place like that? Beats me, my friend. I'm telling you, every time I see people moving to Canada, of all the places you could move to, you chose to move to a wasteland. Do you have any close relatives that moved to Canada? No comment. Okay. You're like, Babuji, don't go. <laughs> <laughs> no, man, but fuck Canada. Of all the places, it's it's so cold there. And I don't see the point of moving there. I mean, it's mostly Indians there anyway. Mm -hmm. Do Are you someone that gets really sad when someone moves? Not particularly. I don't get sad too much. I'm very detached to things. I just, okay, fine. I'll move on. I'll do my own thing. It's cool. Mm -hmm. What about you? Well, I do get sad when someone moves, but then I get over it. Um, one thing for a lot of folks is that, you know, if you have a close friend circle, having a, one of those group chats helps because at a certain point, a lot of you guys are going to be in different parts of the world um, or in different places. And unless someone takes the initiative to stay in touch, most of you guys are just going to grow apart. So a lot of the times when someone is moving, I could tell that, oh man, I'm going to feel a little sad now because it's never going to be the same. And then afterwards, obviously, you move on. But I do get sad in certain doses. Interesting. You, you mentioned that you live in a warmer part of the U.S., correct? 
Would you yes. ever move to Canada? Hell no, bro. Hell no. I wouldn't. First of all, I wouldn't move outside of the U.S. That's point number one. And point number two is that within U.S., there's a lot of different states. I know from people from outside, they only see uh, California, Texas, or New York, and everything else is just a big blob. But there's different states, and within different states, they all have their different feel. Some are like a farm-like feel. Other places are very liberal. Everyone's work, walking with their shirts off and saying bro all the time. Other places are a little bit of everything. So you got to really understand what do you want. And honestly, man, I think location is probably just as important as do you want to have kids or not uh, when you're picking a potential spouse. Because this is a question people don't ask. Remember in our last episode, we were talking about Dink? Mm -hmm. Double income, no kids. For those of you who don't know, a lot of people, when they're you know pursuing someone else, they never ask, do you want to have kids? Which is an important question to ask. But another question people don't ask is, where do you ultimately want to live? And I've seen a couple of couples break up due to that reason alone. One person wants to be in the West Coast. Another person wants to be in the East Coast. And no one wants to compromise. So where you settle down is a very important decision. And it's something you need to start asking in the dating phase. Otherwise, you're setting yourself up for trouble. A lot of this stuff is, what's the word for it? The fundamentals of life, you know, how many kids you want, where you want to live, you know, what religion is the other person. Oh, speaking of religion, do you care about the religion of the girl you ever marry? Yeah, well, before I, I didn't necessarily know, but there was just this w date last year I had, which it wasn't an intellectual thing. It was more so a bodily thing where I was in the date and everything was going well. But then she was just like, I'm a hardcore atheist, like a hardcore. And she starts like, you know, frothing at the mouth talking about that. And <laughs> something <laughs> something in my body, bro, was just like, oh, man, I don't know what it is. You know, you're allowed to have whatever a belief that you want. But in the fertile ground of raising kids, I don't know if that's going to be congruent. So at that point, it was not an intellectual thing. It was just my body alerting me, red flag, red flag, red flag. And then I, ever since that moment, I said, okay, I would prefer someone with a similar world view. This is something that may be prone to change, but for right now, I would say it's important. What about for you? Do you care if she's Hindu? I would strongly prefer a Hindu wife, yes. I mean... If what if I she says I'm Scientologist? To... That's retarded. I'm just messing <laughs> with you. Go <laughs> No, no, no. See, I, no, I would say Hindu. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think I could marry a Muslim because Muslims tend to eat beef more and that's not okay with me. Christians, I'm not too sure of. Personally, in my understanding, Christian girls tend to be far more prone to degeneracy, at least in my experience. I mean, of course, it's just, you know, N is not so big here. So it could just be a flawed sample. But that has been my experience so far. So I would prefer a traditional Hindu girl from a smaller town who hasn't been exposed to a lot of city life. Is it a deal breaker? I don't know, right? I mean, if, if there's a really good girl who happens to be a different religion, do I care about this enough? I don't know. I might, I might not. You only find this kind of stuff out when you're given the actual yes-no choice. You know, when you're presented with an option. Does she have to speak Hindi? Not particularly. I don't care about that enough. I can okay. teach her Hindi. Okay. What about you? Do you what? Do you care if she's Muslim? Well, the Muslim part, yes, uh, I, I would prefer that. Uh, now, with the Bengali, Spanish, Moroccan, whatever, that is something that is still up for debate, up for consideration. Or, um, do you did you ever see a Spanish person before? Like One of my co-founders is Spanish. Yes, but did you meet them in person? Not yet. Okay. Well, whenever. If you live in a place where there's a lot of variety, 
right? If you walk down the street, you see all these different people. Eventually, you're going to extract some data on preferences. You have certain preferences, and sometimes you're someone else's preference. So I noticed that a lot of Spanish girls like me, right? The girls that never will look twice at me are Palestinian, Afghanistan, and uh, I would say Pakistani girls. They, they, they just don't vibe with your boy right here, bro. But with Bengali, Spanish, and Persian girls, they really uh, gravitate towards me. So one time I thought, hmm, what if it's a Spanish girl that is um, a similar world worldview? Can that work? And I thought about it, but I would really prefer a Bengali. That is just a preference. I wouldn't say it's a deal breaker, but it's a preference because there are certain cultural aspects that you need to consider when getting married. And I don't know if I'm at that stage right now where I'm trying to learn someone else's culture and everything. Um, I would prefer where we have that fundamental similarity. And you Does can it speak... matter to you? Go mm-hmm. on, go on. Well, and you can speak the language uh, with the relatives, right? Because a lot of relatives, they're not speaking English all the time. They're speaking their mother tongue. So if you already can somewhat understand it, then it helps. But these are stuff that, as you just said, like you don't fully know until you're presented with yes, no decision. Does the type of Muslim matter to you? For example, does the girl have to be Shia Muslim or Sunni Muslim or w- what are the other types of Islam? I'm not sure. I would what say any form of Islam would do. Right now, man. Okay. I- I'm not trying to be mean when I say this, but a lot of the Shiite Muslims, they have a certain <laughs> look to them. Oh, no, they have a certain look to them. And um, Arman getting noticed, canceled. <laughs> yeah, whatever. I noticed a lot of Shiite Muslims normally gravitate towards other Shiite Muslims, where I have noticed Shiite. And I'm not talking about the belief system at this point. I'm talking about it from a level of attraction. I just noticed from the looks, I'm not traditionally attracted to the Shiite um, practitioners, where they all have a similar look, bro. Um, you won't You won't necessarily know what I'm speaking about, because this is more so an anecdotal um, experience. But I have never been physically attracted to a lot of the Shiite Muslims that I've met within the female uh, parts. And I would say attraction is a big part of um, if you're going to get married to someone. And this is apparently a polarized take nowadays. It's like, well, you, you could grow it to attract, be attracted to someone. For certain groups of people, that may be true. But for me, I, I want to like instantaneously be able to say, say there's potential. You see? What exactly is the difference between these practitioners? Like, why is it, like, what is the difference between Shia and Sunni and everything else? Because from an outsider's perspective, from what I understand, Islam has one book and you're supposed to follow that book. Yeah, you have the Quran, but okay, so the Sunni, Shiite, it's more so something outside of that. I mean, I am not a um, expert on this by any means, but there was some uh, bloodline that, um, of who you should be following versus who you should not be following. And the Sunnis and Shiites disagree on that. That is as far as my intellectual understanding of this matter goes. Isn't it funny how so many wars happen over decisions that were made thousands of years ago? Like There are people who are dying today because people a thousand years ago decided to follow X person instead of Y person and what have you. And you see this yeah. across all religions, all the big ones at least. Oh yeah, absolutely. Another one that people don't talk about is when maps are designed, whenever someone creates uh, like a like a boundary from one country to the next, that can create a lot of wars too. Because now people are fighting for that boundary, for that to be their land. That is actually the case in India where we have a state called Kashmir. And mm-hmm. certain parts of Kashmir are illegally being occupied by Pakistan. And they kind of claim that this is their their land. And there are certain parts of Kashmir which are illegally being occupied by China. And India says, you know, from what I understand, they are actually a part of India. But they find of these countries, back when India used to be much weaker, they find of occupied it. And now they aren't leaving it. And it's been an issue for the past six, seven, eight decades and what have you. And there are a lot of these disputed territories across the world. If you take, if you use Google Maps from Ukraine, you will see that island of Crimea as a part of Ukraine. 
but when you use google maps from russia you see crimea as a part of russia so google mm. maps is being very diplomatic like no matter where like, it it shows you the map according to the country you are from right and you guys fought wars with pakistan before we fought three wars with pakistan mm what if you wanted to bring home a pakistani girl man let's hope that never happens okay so there's your parents would get involved at that point i know it just means that i've kind of lost my intellect got hit on my head or some stupid shit has happened to me that's why i want to bring a pakistani girl <laughs> oh so you don't vibe with pakistanis like that man do you do you know any pakistanis C- close ones i think you have this question because you live in the us right Mm-hmm. and in the us all the stuff is more normal but since i'm right now i'm in india pakistan is literally considered to be an enemy country and every single citizen of pakistan is considered to be an enemy of the country so trying to marry a pakistani girl is like you know trying to bring home an, an enemy citizen it's completely crazy it just Wait, can't happen so if they're viewed as an enemy i'm assuming there's a lot of pakistanis that live in india how are they treated they don't they don't live in india there's no pakistanis in india but there's very very few pakistanis in india the process to get a visa as a pakistani citizen to india is extremely complex there's a lot of police verification you're supposed to keep reporting to the police where you are every so and so time and it's very complex and annoying and let's just say that the indians and the pakistani governments do not trust each other or the people of each other countries and for good reason because there have been a lot of terrorist attacks from pakistan in india that have been done by pakistan and okay. naturally indians do not like pakistan i see i didn't know it was that intense hypothetically let's say you guys are in a, a college dorm and then or, or a college lecture a bunch of the folks are indian and there's two pakistanis are they going to be treated in a different way when you guys find out they're pakistani or you guys are just going to keep it subtle and not talk to them it depends from what i understand a lot of pakistanis when they go abroad they act like they're indians because everybody discriminates against them not just indians but even people from other countries so when you, if you go to dubai a lot of pakistani people will act like they're indian or saudi arabia pakistanis will act like they're indian because because the actions of the country you know they sponsor a lot of these terrorist attacks on other countries people kind of think pakistan equals terrorist and they want to avoid the stigma so they just pretend to be indians mm. okay man i did not know it was that intense pakistan and india well i'll give you a lot of examples i have a friend who died because of a pakistani terrorist attack his father died not him sorry dang man Recently? yeah this was no this was couple, this was like 10 years or so ago where there were these train bombings where a bunch of pakistani people they came and they put a bunch of bombs in trains and a couple of trains blew up and my friend's father was in the train and he died and my friend had to live in poverty because of that so all this terrorist bullshit it hurts a lot of innocent people and it has been proven in many cases or in almost all of these cases and when i say proven i mean there are these pakistani terrorist organizations there are actual terrorist organizations in pakistan who will come and take credit for these bombings they'll say we got did these bombings because of this and this reason and what have you and okay. they are supported by the pakistani government or their intellectual community the isi or what, whatever it is they provide these terrorist organizations protection because from their perspective this is a way to wage war against india without having to officially declare war so a lot of terrorist activities are being done by the pakistani government and the people through these organizations so they are the ones supporting these terrorist organizations in fact i mean the guy who blew up your two towers in the usa on 911 osama bin laden he was being given protection in pakistan remember your military helicopters had to go to pakistan to kill him and the mm. pakistani government was hiding him like why right. is the pakistani government hiding terrorists dang 
and what will happen if indians go to pakistan i don't know to be honest never tried never researched it have you ever been to pakistan probably no 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 you never been never gonna go never been never what's your relationship with bangladesh like much better than pakistan so bangladesh if you know the history of your country it used to be a part of pakistan it used to be east pakistan and because your people are bengali the the people from west pakistan were extremely racist towards east pakistani people to the point that they would starve them deprive them of you know normal human rights and basically completely neglect the people of east pakistan so the people of east pakistan revolted and they they wanted independence and the government of india helped them get independent so bangladesh exists because of the indian military helping it exist if it was not oh, for the indian military bangladesh would not be an independent country so bangladesh people typically see india more favorably than pakistan okay is bangladesh a place you'll ever go or have you been i don't know if i'll ever go there i've never been to bangladesh from my understanding it's not a very rich country there are not i don't see any business interest in going there and it's not a country you go to see the sights there it's not supposed to be nepal where okay you have lots of beautiful mountains or the maldives where there's lots of beautiful beaches so there are no business reasons to go there and there are no tourist reasons to go there so i don't see why i would go to bangladesh is that how you, you typically yeah i mean i would go again i mean last time i went was 2009 it's been a while i just haven't traveled much internationally i've traveled nationally but not overseas too much and if i do go it's typically via cruise to places like mexico bahamas um but to go all the way across the world i mean possibly i just don't know when mm you were asking me some question before so most of your trips are determined by business reasons and tourist reasons yeah i mean i will go to a place i mean if i go to dubai right it's not me going as a tourist i got business reasons to be there i got to save taxes or what have you but dubai is not a place where i'm going to chill have you seen the temperatures there they suck it's hot it's hot but if i want to travel for business definitely i'm going to go anywhere necessary but on the other hand if i want to travel for pleasure then i want the good stuff i want to go to places where there are mountains or beaches or something to see do you splurge when you're traveling define splurge because i'm at the point where i could keep spending money and it just doesn't matter like i told you i saved 95 97% of my income i don't even try to save my money but it's just how it is right now it is based on your lifestyle i mean do you have to stay in a five star hotel eat at five star restaurants no no uh, no i i don't do that i when i travel i want to stay at a cheaper place a local place which is more authentic right and i want to eat local food so if i'm going to say a mountain i want to eat whatever that these people are eating locally man i'm the same way dude where if i'm traveling i want to get the experience the local experience um and this is where it becomes very difficult to determine who's cheap and who's frugal um like you know cheap it has a very negative connotation it's like this guy is scarce but frugal it doesn't really have a negative connotation it actually has a wise connotation but determining who's cheap and who's frugal is very difficult to do and i'll give you an example and if anyone w- wants to try this example out um here's what you need to do find something that you are very laid back on and then find someone who's very picky on the thing that you're laid back on and let's say only one person can get their way who gets their way so let's say harsh i am not that picky of a eater right i could eat taco bell mcdonald's chipotle whatever but you you have to eat uh, gourmet food now if you and me are arguing on where to go eat you're always going to call me cheap and you're going to view yourself as frugal where i'm going to view you as lavish and me as frugal does that make sense ah 
but the flip side is also true. So let's say for food, um, whatever, but with clothes, I, I spend at least $1,000 on a suit, but you're an off the rack kind of guy. You see? So if I'm we're ever trying to convince you on what suit to get, I'm always going to call you cheap while uh, you're going to view yourself as frugal. So this is actually a very funny thing, especially when you're trying to go on a trip with someone. Because a guy like you, you don't really care where you stay, right? I mean, you, we were talking about you sleeping on the floor. But let's say Harsh's spouse, his future spouse, wants a five-star uh, experience of a hotel. Now you guys are debating, and the word cheap is going to get thrown around a lot. Huh, interesting. Let's hope I have a better spouse than that. But <laughs> It'll be in one my, thing, man. Yeah. Is there something you're very picky on? I'm very picky about not having bullshit oils in my food. Okay, okay. That could easily stir up <laughs> certain debates. <laughs> They'll be like, Harsh, let's go to McDonald's. You're like, don't you know the ingredients in McDonald's? <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you eat at McDonald's, dear? I get a proper meal afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, if you ever get a girl to track calories, they also become very picky eaters. A McDonald's mm -hmm. burger is like 600 calories. And a girl eats like 1,400 a day. So for her, a burger is like half her day, isn't it? Bro, I knew this one girl that would drink so much soda. And she had an insanely nice body. and she, But she would drink so much soda. And I don't know how her internal workings were. But just looks-wise, you could never tell. And you know how much sugar one bottle of soda has? Was she drinking diet soda or regular soda? Regular soda. Fuck that, man. You're, you're big into diet now, right? Yeah, I've been cutting fat. So, yeah. Diet coke it is. Pissing off everybody on Twitter. Dude, there's 60 grams of sugar in a 20-ounce coke. How much is 20 ounce in non-retard? Like, one of these ones. <laughs> I said non-retard. <laughs> 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 What's your version of ounce? How many convert? liters is that? Oh, God. This guy. We do use liters, but for the big ones. Um, oh, 20 ounces, not even a liter? That's crazy. No, 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 no. 20 ounces is the one that you just drank. It's 0.59 liter. Oh, so you're, Point... you're a big... Yeah, yeah, dude. 20 ounces is a very small one. I don't drink soda, but it's one that you could just eat with a burger. The one liter one is 60 grams of sugar in a glass whoa whoa okay that's insane. right and she drank at least three to five of those a day how is she not diabetic that's crazy know. but the crazy thing is you would never be able to tell she had a very nice body so you you've been drinking diet coke and i'm sure you've been stirring up a lot of controversy the whole aspartame thing the aspartame thing is so overstated. It's a possible carcinogen. Well, you know what? Aspartame has been classified as a class 2B carcinogen, which means there is limited evidence that it could be carcinogenic. And this class of carcinogenic products also has things like pickle. So aspartame is in the same class of being a carcinogen as pickle and talcum powder is. People act like drinking a can of Diet Coke is going to give them cancer. They're completely crazy. They, they just see, okay, possible carcinogen. This means they're going to get cancer. It is a class 2B carcinogen, which is like a classification. It's been added to that list. And that class contains a whole bunch of items which you're eating, like pickles, vegetables, a lot of vegetables, actually, and talcum powder and things like this. So if you care so much about aspartame, then you also have to give up on vegetables, pickles, talcum powder, and a whole bunch of other items. Hmm. So why do so many people say that for? I mean, is there any credibility to what they're saying? I don't think so. Are you drinking I mean, a lot a... of Diet Coke? No, man. Like, one every few days. Oh, okay, because a lot of folks that 
suggest that Diet Coke advice, they drink five to ten a day. What the fuck? The, the tiny ones. I drink that two fifty ml one or three hundred ml. I don't know how much it is, but you don't think it tastes bad? I don't care. It's just sweeter, and sometimes you just need to rest that craving. Plus, it has some caffeine, so it's an appetite suppressant. You were talking about something else that you've been drinking recently, the protein water. Oh yeah, I got this thing. It's called Aqua Teens Protein Water, and it's just water with some sweetener and twenty one grams of protein, and this shit is amazing. Twenty mm. one grams of protein, fifty? Uh, no, not fifty. About a hundred calories, no fat, no carbohydrates, just pure protein drink. Oh, that's not bad at all, and it tastes good. It tastes really good. Do you drink it's, it before and after workouts or just No, I just drink it whatever. as a way to kill a craving, you know. Let's say you eat a bunch of food but because you're not eating carbohydrates, you still feel like okay, let me get something sweet inside me now. That's when you eat this. See, this is one of the blessings of me, man. I've never been a sweets guy. And if you're as someone that doesn't crave sweets, so much of your cutting experience is made easier. You see? Because a lot of reasons people can't cut is because they get into some trouble with cookies, Nutella, Oreos, etc. But if you don't crave that, it's such a leg up. You're doing one meal a day, right? One meal a day. What are you eating in that one meal? One meal, I'll typically eat a steak, broccoli, potatoes, and I'll switch out the carbs. Sometimes I'll eat pasta. Sometimes I'll eat uh, potatoes. But it's a pretty big steak. You know what? Let me try. I haven't done one meal a day. So let well, me you... try to eat one meal a day for two weeks and let's see how well it goes. Okay, well, I don't want you to... Because I don't want you to get in any trouble because you said you fainted one time doing it. That was a long time ago. Maybe okay, like no. eight years ago. Yeah, because I, I do want to recommend to people like this is not advice by any means. Because some folks, when they try OMAD, it doesn't work for them. But for some folks, it really works for them. So I'm just one of those folks where I've been doing OMAD for two years and I do not see myself going back. Well, I'm going to have to somewhat compromise when I'm in a long-term relationship because here's what I found out, Harsh. Food makes up a large part of relationships, uh, especially it's going to be with you because you don't drink either. Um, and for me, and let's say the person you're dating is not going to drink. So a lot of when you're traveling, like the food thing is going to be a staple of it. And if you're going to a new place and you're like, well, I'm not eating till night, you're becoming a bus <laughs> kill of sorts. <laughs> so, so you got to try it out, man. But I kid you not, bro. My brother came to um, Tampa a couple of weeks ago. We had a, a bunch of get togethers and I broke the OMAD and I was eating throughout the day. I was eating pretty healthy too. Uh, the typical three to five meals. I don't know how people do it, dude. Because I had brain fog like none other. I was yawning. And afterwards, I ate. It's like, oh, man, I got to work right now. I don't really want to work. I want to take a nap. So I give props to folks that eat three to five meals and still remain productive. Let me try. Today is the 28th of July, right? Let me eat OMAD for 10 days. I'll get back to you on how it goes for me. Okay. For sure. I think in terms of like recent memory, like if, you're, if your perspective is 100 to 200 years, OMAD sounds ridiculous. But I think if you your perspective is history, OMAD actually makes a lot of sense. I didn't see our ancient ancestors eating three to five at times a day. I think they had to hunt. They had to get their work done. Then they enjoyed the satisfaction of eating. If they were just eating a lot, I would say eating a lot is like, jerking off as soon as you wake up in the morning. There's no desire to do more. Um, and I saw this documentary, uh, I don't know how accurate it is, about how a bunch of cereal companies created the concept of breakfast so they could sell yeah, more Kellogg. cereal. Kellogg did oh, that, you yes. heard about this. Oh, so is it yes, true? Kellogg, it's true. <clears throat> breakfast is the most important meal of the day is something Kellogg's came up with. It no was way. their marketing jingle. Think of it like this. Mm -hmm. People typically did not eat breakfast unless they were working in a farm. And I'm basing this off, say, even ancient writings, right? right. If you read ancient writings, 
if you were eating breakfast, it used to be considered gluttony. But hey, this guy's eating breakfast. He's eating right after waking up. He's a glutton. And the only people who could eat breakfast without getting, you know, mocked were people who were like slaves and they were working on a farm and they would be given a biscuit or something. You know, eat this, go work on the farm like a bitch. But people mm-hmm. were not eating breakfast all the time. But you had this thing, the Industrial Revolution. And with the Industrial Revolution, the concept came in where you sit and you work all day and then you go home and you're not moving around too much. And with the Industrial Revolution, you ca- two new concepts came up. The word boredom was invented. It, it didn't exist in the vocabulary before. And secondly, breakfast became more important. So the word boredom just did not exist before. The, the concept, right? I'm bored. This thing wasn't a thing. It's a modern thing after the industrial age. Not stimulated enough or bored. And the concept of breakfast became popular after the industrial age. Interesting. I never knew that. It's insane, right? The word boredom did not exist. Imagine if the word still didn't exist. Imagine how many winners we would have. I don't know, man. Sometimes when all these word factory people, right, they keep coming mm-hmm. up with new words, something or phobic. I'm like, why do you want to invent all this bullshit? Now, now right. that you've given it a label, more and more people are going to adopt it. Right. And they're going to attach their identity to it. That's why Henry Ford, he didn't have that many labels in his uh, Ford's Motor Company. He just had workers and managers. That's it. Uh, so uh, his logic was when you have too many of these labels, people begin to work for the label rather than the company. So Jim, I mean, he was so good before of a worker, but now he cares more about becoming a senior manager, not a junior manager, uh, because it's not a good look for him. So now he doesn't care about the company. So Henry Ford said, all right, let's just get rid of all these labels and let's just boil it down to two, worker, manager. I don't know if that will work in the modern company, though. Yeah, the modern company, man, you most of these folks nowadays, that is their version of a career, uh, working for a label, working for managerial director, not a regular supervisor. And for my last company, you actually had like these Facebook profiles for just the company, right? It, within the intranet. And these guys, whenever they would get a promotion, they would quickly update it on their bio. And they're just waiting for that. That was their incentive, just so they could change uh, the label on their bio. They didn't care about cost cutting or saving the company uh, money or creating value. They were just trying to switch that label. And you could still provide a lot of value in the process of switching that label, but it just perverted the process. And I was working for a Fortune 500 company. So this is a big company. So the higher that you get up, the sharper and cleaner that your label looks. Like I am a senior uh, directional managerial director. Like, I don't know what the fuck that means, but it sounds important. And (laughs) you just get a lot of clout that way, dude. Especially if you are working in a company. This was before the work from uh, home concept. So you're always seeing these folks. So now this is becoming your turf. Have you noticed that women care more about labels than men do? I would say in certain contexts, yes. But career-wise, I don't know, man. I've seen a lot of men fight for those labels too. Are you talking about with career or something else? In general, in the sense that if you if I could offer you two jobs, one that pays one hundred and thirty five thousand and one that pays one hundred fifty thousand, but the one that is one hundred and thirty five has a better sounding label, and the one fifty one has some dumbass label, you know, like technician or something like that. There's plenty of men who are, who are gonna pick the one fifty thousand dollar per year position because it pays more. But right. women will pick the better sounding position. You know, I am senior director. Hmm. The Porsche thing, not technician. <laughs> <laughs> Women Probably. care more about prestige in my observation. Even mm-hmm. when they're dating, right? They will not hit a carpenter. Even if the carpenter makes more money, they would rather date some HR guy in debt. 
Mm. Man, what's up with the whole HR position? Do you see that being a thing if work from home continues to become more of a concept? A lot of people don't really get what HR does, right? They think HR is just a bunch of lazy assholes sitting around doing nothing. But I'll give you like a quick breakdown of the few things HR is supposed to do. Firstly, HR is supposed to recruit employees for your company. That is, find talent from the world. And the second function is retain the talent, make sure people are happy, make sure the rules of your organization are being followed. And the third function is to protect your company against your employees. Sometimes the employees might try to scam the company or steal stuff from the company, or they might have disputes among themselves and HR job is to resolve that, right? As long as you want or need people working in your company, you will need to have HR. Either you do the HR yourself or you have a department to do it for you. Because to have people in the company, you have to recruit them, correct? Correct. If you do it, then you're your HR department. But typically in any bigger company, you need to have, you'll have a guy whose job is to do recruitment. So that guy is your HR. Whether it's work from home, however it is, someone has to recruit people. Someone has to make sure that... I've heard of an individual position called recruiter. I didn't know that was part of HR. That's a part of HR, yes. Gotcha. The only concept of HR I had is th- these are the people you reach out to if sexual harassment within the workforce is involved. That's the only concept of HR that I had. So you just taught me something new. Yeah. In fact, this is something I learned recently where there's a guy who I know who is an HR and we kind of mock him about it. You're like, dude, you're an HR. You just do nothing. Just shut up. You're not working. <laughs> like we call him up like, what are you doing? I'm at work. No, you're not. Just come here. <laughs> and he was telling us like how stressful and difficult his job is because he has to do recruiting. And I, see. I know recruiting is very annoying because I used to recruit people for clients before. Mm-hmm. And so- sometimes what happens is, let's say you recruit somebody, you schedule an interview and the guy just doesn't show up for the interview. And that actually happens much more frequently than you think. It happens about 40% of the time mm-hmm. where someone schedules an interview and doesn't show up. Bitch, why did you schedule an interview? <laughs> you made me clear up my schedule and you're not showing up. Some folks do this if you are a consultant and if you give, if you give one of those free 15-minute consults, they'll book a session and they won't show up. Man, people are assholes like that. But yes, that yeah. happens quite a bit. And he's like, let's say you have to recruit for a managerial position and you find a good candidate, you do your three, four interviews, you, you send in to the technical team. Now the technical team is supposed to make sure that, you know, this guy actually has the technical talent. And then you pray that he has the technical talent because if the technical team rejects him, then you got to repeat the entire process, find another guy, yeah. do the three, four interviews with him again. And apparently HR is a very stressful job. Do they get a, a percentage if they do get a client? I think his company, that's how the company earns, but this guy is just an employee. And he's the guy I met while at Trekking, so not like a very successful guy, but a cool, relaxed guy who likes having fun and climbing mountains. Mm-hmm. I've been meeting a lot of folks like that where they're not super ambitious with their career, but they are still well-rounded individuals in other parts of life. And it's really easy to rule them out where you'll look at the guy and you'll say, you're making how much? That's all? Well, what are you going to do next? They'll say, well, I'm just happy where I am. And initially, the the presuppositions that many ambitious folks have is that this guy's a loser. He has nothing to teach me. And then you start talking to this guy more. And it's a pretty interesting person. Uh, they traveled to a lot of pockets of places that you've never even heard of. Uh, they um, volunteer. They do a bunch of They're family men. They have successful kids. So they're not ambitious with their career. They're still well-rounded in other aspects. I've noticed noticed that. that. I agree with you. I do think that a lot of your friendships, especially the age that we are in, Mm -hmm. it comes down to friendships for some common interests. For example, if I want to go trekking, then I'll call up people who like trekking. It's going to be people like this. If I want to say, you know, 
start a new company then i'm going to talk to different people who are interested in that thing mm-hmm. and maybe those guys are not fit maybe they are lacking in that department if i want to work out with a group then i might call up my fitter friends they might be dumber or smart or you know they might have they might be lacking in some or the other thing right so it's very very difficult to find people who are perfect in all departments but if you are interested in one particular hobby or activity you can definitely make friends with people who are good at that activity only whether mm-hmm. or not they're doing well in other aspects of their life or not Absolutely. If you take a guy who can bench 180 kg, you can learn a thing or two about benching from him whether or not he's making money. Yeah. I I like that. I actually like the way you framed that because I know this one guy who if you view him from his career, he is a straight up loser. I mean, he's been in school for so many freaking years and he just keeps doing these gas station jobs, working as a cashier. And from a career aspect, he has failed. But this is the guy that I always head up whenever I'm going to a networking event or I'm trying to introduce a couple of friends that don't know each other I invite this guy because if you put this guy in any social setting it lights up I mean he's that charismatic so this guy I keep him around because there's been plenty of times where he'll be my hype man he'll make me look good he's a good wingman uh he can help you close deals um for your business and much more so I keep him around and i see myself keeping him around because he has such good social skills so you need folks from different aspects you can't just have everyone just be like you yeah that's not how the real world works right mm-hmm. how what are the chances of finding someone who is not only doing well in business but also intelligent also likes to read also likes to trek i mean you're going to be you there's only mm-hmm. one arman there's only one harsh If you want to go trekking just find people who like trekking and then go trek. Don't right. overthink, you know, don't judge them by other things. Otherwise yeah. you will just not find company. Yeah, you're not going to find company and as an adult it actually becomes harder to make friends because people are now becoming very solidified in their identity, which means they have a job, they have their own family, they have their own time that they want to relax. So you trying to find a friend as an adult and if you even want to make it more complex you just moved right when you move somewhere new you have to pretty much start over how are you going to do it and one of the ways to do it is that you don't want to just look for a certain model and that said you want to keep your mind open you want to see if you could join some clubs and from there get the ball rolling that's why toastmasters has always been a um like a safe haven for me because no matter where i go whenever i moved from florida to virginia i didn't know anyone there I just joined the Toastmasters. I started to get um cool with the members. They invited me out for after hours. We chilled, we talked, and I view Toastmasters as a social skills club, not just public speaking. But for you, it may be different. Did you ever join any trekking clubs? Oh yeah, I know a lot of these guys. I know a lot of people who own trekking clubs and I'm friends with them, so I typically trek with them. Okay, so you don't always do it solo. You sometimes go with a organization a lot of treks are not safe to do solo a lot of these treks involve using ropes someone to make sure that if you enjoy yourself they can get you down the mountain getting up the mountain is not as hard as getting down is because when you get down you might have injured something if you take the trek i went to a trek last week and i got bitten by a whole bunch of leeches and i fucked up a toe of mine i was without my shoes i was near a waterfall i slipped and when you slip you kind of fall in the slimy part which has a lot of insects i hurt mm-hmm. my toe and i got a whole bunch of leeches bit me and i didn't know how oh, to damn. remove them so i was trying to flick them off and some of them kind of broke apart and the juices kind of got on my skin very freaky good my point is that if i had gotten sick or maybe broke my leg if i was alone i would be fucked because i was in quite a bit of altitude very isolated area and other than this group if i was alone maybe for 48 hours no one would no one would have come there were you ever injured alone. by yourself by yourself what do you mean while trekking alone yeah did you ever get injured while you were trekking by yourself I typically do not trek by myself. I typically have someone else. Either I typically pay locals to trek with me. 
or I have oh, a local friend down. who goes, guide me through the track, you know. I don't, I'm happy to pay somebody 20, 50 bucks or something to help me drive. Do you have to convince them or no, are no, they eager to well. say yes, money? They're eager to say yes, like, yeah, I'll go with you. Like, can you I buy also come <laughs> after? You buy them food after? Yeah, I don't mind. See, the thing is, I'm at a point where what is decent income for these guys is something I might make in every three minutes. Mm. So I don't mind paying them well. Plus, I these the places I go to trek, they're very remote in the sense that there are people, these are people who might sometimes live in a hut who make $50 a month or $100 a month. And I might pay them $100 for two days of helping me out. So they're more than happy to do it. There's just no problem, you know. It's a small economy. I'm helping out these local people. They're helping me track. It's a win-win situation. And as they're helping you up the track, are you talking to them? Oh, yeah. I always talk to them. Learn quite a bit. I often so, go and meet their families after the track. So are these guys friends with you at this point? Because I'm assuming that you are repeating certain tracks with the same folks. So the conversations are getting deeper. Are they becoming your friends? It depends. Some of those treks I just do once and that's it. Some locations I go more than once. And yeah, the guy know, knows me. He's friends with me. He knows what I like. He'll bring me food that I like. So if I'm like, I like this stuff at your house. So I'll get it next time I go. Man, if I'm those guys, I'm centering a business around satisfying Life Math Money's trek needs. They could there make a lot, a lot of money of that way. Companies in the, there are a lot of trekking companies in India. A lot. No, but they should only serve you because you got the money, you have the desire to trek, <laughs> and you have the rapport with them, man. Yeah, I'll bring my friends too sometimes to trek with me. And yeah, they love it. It's a win win right. situation, right? Like for me, it's not a lot of money. For them, it is. For me, the trek experience is very important. And the thing is that when you pay someone decently well, they take really good care of you. Right. Dang, that's what's up, man. So are you going to another trek soon? I just got back four days ago. I was in a jungle, this waterfall thing, got bit by a whole bunch of insects that I'm not sure. And I think this weekend I'm going to rest. Next weekend I might go. Okay. Do you ever take your family with you? I took them a few times. My family doesn't enjoy it nearly as much as me. From their perspective, trekking is a strenuous activity, so it's not fun. You need to right. have a certain fitness level to enjoy it. Gotcha. Have you trekked yeah. before? I mean, for us, dude, there's not as much um, locations to trek. I would say I have trekked when I visit places outside. Like I've trekked in Hawaii. I've trekked in certain parts in Florida as well. But there's not trails that I'm aware of where I can just routinely go. Why don't you move to India? <laughs> maybe. Maybe I'll... Uh, I, I don't know about moving, but maybe I'll visit and you could be my trek tour guide. Sounds good. I would love to help you trek. So were you ever in any sort of organizations as a kid? Did you do karate, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts? We did not have any of this. Were you in one of them? No, man. I used to like beg my parents to let me join the Boy Scouts. And because when you're a little kid, they give you these brochures. And sometimes you'll see that someone's a Boy Scout your age. And they have these cool little badges and ribbons. I'm like, Mom, Dad, I want to do this. They're like, boy, shut up. Like, go back to studying. So I wanted to do it, but I, I couldn't do it. I did karate, but not Boy Scouts. Why couldn't they, why didn't they let you do Boy Scouts? It's just one of those things where you're going to be outside a lot and um, you're going to be hanging with a bunch of Americans. We just came to the country and my parents were somewhat strict when we first came. Like uh, we weren't hanging out with kids outside of school too much. So hanging with them the entire summer was not something that they were vibing with. So we didn't do it. And it's all good. I mean, we st we hung out with a lot of our uh, family friends as kids. That was uh, our crew growing up. Mm -hmm. Are you still I friends see. with are you still friends with your family friends as kids? 
found some of them i'm very good friends with yes mm-hmm. they have a lot of common hobbies with me like trekking i have a friend who goes with me trekking a lot of the times it's a lot of fun and that guy is extremely intelligent mm-hmm. so he's from one of these iits i'm not sure where he's from but i think he's from one of these iits so he's an engineer computer scientist and super super smart dude the gotcha. dumb ones i'm not in touch with bro i'm glad you brought that up because a lot of these guys that you want to dawots with which are little parties uh, for english feast. speakers feasts yes um a lot of these kids that you were basically growing up with year by year right because your families were friends a lot of them you see them take the wrong trajectory in life i recall one of them became addicted to crack and what? i thought man dude i know your mom too your mom is so freaking strict she must be so upset with you right now and that was one and then another family friend became a straight up simp i'm talking like king simp and they should make uh, movies about this guy or don't uh so he became like that uh other guys become very impressive they start to you know work on their careers and some guys became bodybuilders but you see these folks because they're not your family but they're sort of like a second tier family especially if you only got social experiences outside of school with these folks um so you see them evolving and some unfortunately you see them devolving how did this guy become addicted to crack this guy had a lot of self esteem issues and he was typically the guy that we used to we used to roast a lot in our friend circle but we didn't really know much about him he, he was just a good sport all the time so when he got into college he started to smoke weed that's how it always begins he starts smoking weed and then he started to hang with a lot of these bad folks and they just graduated him from weed to cocaine to heroin eventually crack and it got so bad dude that he would uh steal money from his dad to uh, to pay for his crack addiction and his parents didn't know what to do so one day they took him to bangladesh right and he thinks he's just going to visit a couple of uh, relatives in bangladesh and what happened was uh, the parents just say bye and the doors close in the building that he's in and the place that he's going to be in for the next 6 months is a psychiatric ward and they're basically going to fix him up in bangladesh because they don't his parents don't have the money to um you know do what do you call it this rehab in the US so he's doing it in bangladesh and during his time in bangladesh bro he met a girl there and that girl was for him the best thing to ever happen because she got his life on track and eventually uh, he stopped doing any form of drugs he doesn't even drink alcohol anymore uh he married the girl in bangladesh and now he brought her to the US recently so i chilled with him uh 6 months ago uh we were watching one of the basketball games and i asked him about his story and he just told me everything and you could tell the drugs that a number on him he's he speaks a little bit slower like this now it's unfortunate because i've seen him when he was like this sharp as a tack sort of guy but he's still now in the right path it just drugs did do a number on him but it's good because now he's married he's trying to have a kid he has a house so he's getting his life back in order man that sucks it sucks man because it's he's a smart kid he was a good kid too so drugs man stay away from that guys do not let these guys peer pressure you into doing this sort of stuff because it just starts off with something tiny and then it starts to build up and just like that your life is ruined uh you don't talk to your relatives or siblings his sibling still hasn't forgiven him though So him and his sibling haven't talked in 6 years because of all the pain that he caused. Uh so I I've noticed a lot of guys especially um once they hit 30s man a lot of them don't talk to their sibling. I'm like well, when's the last time you talked to your brother? It's like we don't talk anymore. What? You don't talk to your brother? For me that's blasphemous. That's crazy. Yeah. He must have done some pretty fucked up shit. Yeah, when you are you've never known someone that got addicted to drugs, right? I have not. Or alcohol. Yeah, they become 
a havoc for their close circle. And in rehab, apparently, they teach you about all of these stuff. And you have to... Sometimes in rehab, you have to make amends with folks that you did wrong. You have to write letters to them and say, you're a different person now. And you have to ask for forgiveness. It's a process. So he apparently did a lot of fucked up things to his family. Um, and um, the brother just never forgave him for that. Hmm. What about the simp? that lived in New York. I used to be really excited when he used to come to Florida because we would do like fishing, basketball, watch movies together and we'd roast, roast my brother. So we got along. And then um, a couple of years goes on by. Uh, he gives me a call a year ago and he's like, hey, uh, Armand, my mom showed me the Armani Talks YouTube channel. I've been watching a lot of your videos. Uh, I really want to get into it. Mind you, we haven't talked in over a decade. So I don't know why he's just calling me out of the blue moon. So there's a real reason he's calling me. So we're over here um, talking, and eventually I ask, um, are you calling me for a particular reason? And this guy is um, calling because he just had a breakup. And he's telling me about the breakup, about how he bought a house. He was expecting his girlfriend was going to move to the house. But instead of moving to the house, she sleeps with his brother's best friend. And I thought, wait a minute, she slept with your brother's best friend? Last time I saw you, bro, your brother was a little kid. That means she slept with a really young dude, um, even after all the years have passed. And he's like, yeah, man, but I still love her. What do you think I should do? I'm like, what do you mean, what do, you, what do I think you should do? You break up with her and you move on. And this guy is trying to, like, um, he's trying to, like, logic, w logic with me. He's like, oh, man, bro, bro, I love her. I don't know if I'll ever see someone like her again. And in moments like this, you don't sugarcoat things because guys who are going through breakups see a different reality than what is really reality. So you have to be very blunt. You say, look, bro, she's a slut. You could do better. You need to do better. Level up and move on. And after this phone call, he ends by saying that he's not going to take my advice. And he said he's going to uh, give her another shot. I was like, man, like this guy. Um, and so he gave her another shot. And then she did it again. She cheated on him again. And then he just texted me, you were right. So you got to listen, man. You got to listen, especially when cheating is involved. Infidelity, you, you're not going to be able to look at the person in a diff the same, especially if you're a guy and the girl cheated on you. So this is not one of those things where love conquers all. Like you will resent the person. You'll probably throw it in their face when you guys are having an argument. Cut your ties ASAP and move on. Man, I think people have zero self-respect. They stay in such relationships. <laughs> Dude, man, this is actually more common than you think. A lot of folks, when they are going through a breakup, there's most people think it's just called a breakup. But after the breakup, there's a thing called the dance and the dance is where you one ex reaches out to the other ex and says remember the good old times and the ex that is being reached out to begins to remember the good old times and now they're uh, they're completely forgetting why they broke up in the first place and they're just dwelling on the good old times thinking that if they get back together with this ex it's just going to be the good old times again and this is a big mistake you should actually prepare for the dance and to avoid the dance, once you break up with someone, cut all contact. These guys that stay in contact with their exes, talk to them still. Why? How are you going to move on if you're staying in touch with your ex? For the most part, I, I know certain guys like yourself can detach very quickly. But for most guys out there who fell in love, you should not be staying in touch with your ex. That's a weird thing to do. Unless kids are involved. If kids are involved, um, then it's a little bit detailed. But if you're like a 21 year old guy like still staying in touch with your ex you're weirdo to me it seems to have become a trend you know yeah we broke up but we're still friends i'm like why are you still friends what right. are you gaining yeah like what practical value are you getting from this people are idiots man they just want to waste their time yeah did you ever have to just t give tell it like it is advice when someone reached out to you for relationship advice? Do people reach out to you for relationship advice? 
in real life uh they yeah. don't because i, I give think, them very blunt advice they don't want to hear right yeah i think when people see the armani talks brand discusses communication skills they automatically at times come to me for relationship advice i'm like dude the communication skills i talk about are public speaking and writing skills for engineers and entrepreneurs if you want relationship advice go to dr taylor burrows she handles that sort of stuff they're like no 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 i trust you so i'm like bro you don't want relationship advice from me because i'm pretty blunt with it i'm like you i like taylor burrows she has good advice no no i do things. no that's what i'm saying uh, that's why you should go to her because she specifically is targeted for relationship advice you see where i'm not targeted for relationship advice i'm more so for public speaking and writing skills I've noticed that a lot of these western coaches right I disagree with a lot of their way of thinking I mean not Burrows mm-hmm. Burrows is pretty good she's really good yeah she's really really good but in general a lot of these western dating coaches they don't seem to take in family and factors like that into account they just focus on okay is this girl or guy decent or not like there are more things to consider you know like the, the their background the culture you know whether they may have any money or not things like that you know how much power does a family possess is this the mm-hmm. family your family would want to associate with and they just don't think this way they, in their culture it doesn't exist so in the west marriage is just like something between two individuals they just do it together and it's done but in our country in india at least and most of these conservative parts of the world it's 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 much more than that it's like an alliance between two families and you have to consider the families seriously you can't just ignore it altogether and you know the other things i was telling you about like i think burrows is more forgiving on virginity than i am in the sense she's like if a girl hasn't dated for someone for 2 years she's you know pretty good you know she's she's moved on from her lifestyle i don't think that way you know i think girls just get older and they're what's the word for it well they can no longer get a certain quality of guy and they you know in their mind time is running out so that's when they start quote and quote getting serious and looking for a husband but they haven't changed they've just gotten older you know if you make a 29 year old magically 21 again she'll do the same things mm that one billionaire's daughter that you were talking about how old is she 22 i think do you think someone that's 22 um are you when you said that she was not compatible um was it mainly with conversation material or did you just think she also lacked skills so i wonder how much skills these 22 year old girls can have i don't know right i didn't process it too much i was so busy with business back then that i think i rushed that particular one i might go back to it or maybe look for a different one i'm not sure is she still single i don't know i haven't checked um But You're I was like, just so busy back then. I just I made a quicker decision than I should have. Maybe let's see. Right, right. Did you notice that though? When let's say, I I think you're around twenty seven, twenty eight. When you get matched with a twenty one year old girl, do you guys find it difficult to talk? No, man. I can talk to anybody. Okay. I'm I mean, very good with this type of social skill. If I want to talk to someone, I can go to their level and talk with them. You no know, cuz I remember one of our interactions you were saying that one of the girls you were talking to she was just talking about TikTok videos and viral trends. I can talk with someone like that. I just don't enjoy the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> you download TikTok, do some market research, then <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah, I've seen the shut up a prank. <laughs> Your TikTok is banned over there, so you TikTok have to do market research here, yes. another way. Yeah, that was back when it was not banned. Personally I prefer younger girls. They tend to be more happy and less less in a rush. Were you I mean is there a certain deal breaker where I I get the virginity aspect but something personality wise that you just cannot stand? I don't like girls who act in a very entitled way, you know, like I'm extra empowered and you know men are supposed to bow to me type of trick like that's not going to happen. Like yeah, if you want to date me, the dynamic is simple. I'm a man, you're a woman. You look up to me, and if you're not interested, then I'm not interested. At what call do yeah. you notify her of this? 
you know, if she's acting out, I just tell her, you know, like, look, th- we can only date if you have a healthy respect for me being the leader of this relationship. If you're not into that, that's fine. Probably date someone else. Man, trying to date a disrespectful girl, I can't even yeah, imagine just, it. Doesn't work. Doesn't work. You know, a lot so... of these girls have been watching so much TikTok and what have you, and they think being bratty is a good thing, you know. And I don't mean the bratty in a fun way. I mean like you know, trying to show everybody that they have authority. I'm like, if you want authority, you're dating the wrong guy. I'm just telling you up front, this is not how it works with me. I'm not going to, this, this is not going to work out if you're going to be like this. Yeah. If you are happy with being under the terms I've given you, then sure. Otherwise we need to not, we need to see other people. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay, so your one is entitled. My one is very masculine energy, where if I get masculine energy out of you, um, I don't mind you like being masculine, like just as a person, do what you got to do. But as a romantic partner, I cannot find myself attracted to you. Define masculine energy. What do you mean here? Man, dude, see, this is where it gets really d- difficult to define energy, but sometimes you could just tell when you're interacting with someone. Man, I don't want to be mean, but lawyer chicks, dude. A lot of lawyer chicks are very just like, hey, let's do this. Let's do that. And Ah, you mean authoritative girls, you know? Not authoritative. Yeah, man. But like, I'm not saying like they tell me what to do or anything. It's just like the defaultness. Okay. Yeah, they do you know what the bubbly means? Or, you know, yeah, I know. I yeah. know what you're talking about. Now picture the opposite the boss of bubbly. Wave thing. The boss wave thing, you know? Yeah, I'm man. in control of the situation, that bit chick. Where I have no problem. Like, if you like your career, you do your career, whatever. Um, but the aggressive, um, the antithesis of bubbly, bubbly. If I see th- that from you, a six can go into an eight for me. If I see that you have that bubbly, giggly personality, I'm like, I like this. You make me feel like a comedian because your boy's a little funny sometimes, but you make me feel funny. I like you because uh, now it's like you're pleasant. You have this nice um, thing about you, and that's the thing with energy, dude. Where it's very difficult to, um put into words that's why you need to at least meet someone you can't always just be going by text or calls you gotta actually meet them and see if there's uh, some sort of energy that is difficult to put into words at least there uh, so that that is important in my opinion you know speaking of things i don't like i don't like girls who are too plain when it comes to excitement you know some girls are so shy and boring that they aren't excited about anything if you like leave them by themselves, shy is fine, but you don't want to be so plain that your only interest is in life is watching Netflix. Oh, yeah. Absolutely, man. All you do is you go to your job, you watch Netflix, repeat. That is not going to work with me. I when have you, hobbies. I want to enjoy them. When you ask a girl, like, what do you do for fun? And when they ask you, there's typically going to be seven responses that you can give. I, I mean, not everyone is going to say like, you know, play chess or something. The, the typical ones are what? Uh, from your experience, and I'll say it from my experience. Traveling is something that people will say. Netflix, foodie. Yeah, foodie, they'll say. A lot of girls, when I ask them, like, what are what do you do for fun? They never say Netflix. They do Netflix, but they'll never say it when I ask them, what do they do for fun? Because I think they also see that that's in poor taste. Um, at least from my experience. I never heard a girl say, uh, when I ask, what do you do for fun? She's like, oh, I watch Netflix. That's something that I uncovered later on throughout the interaction. But she'll typically say, um, and it's such a bland question too, because if you are you know, spinning plates or whatever, you're going to ask that question and you're just going to get similar responses. You're going to be asked that question and you're probably going to give similar responses. How else do you answer that question? What do you do for fun? The, see, I'll tell you what. With a lot of these questions, I'll tell you how to answer that question as a guy. Okay. With girls, right? If you tell them directly, you know, I'm an exciting, happy person who likes doing fun things. They'll think you're a dork. You're a nerd. Like, who says I'm a happy, excited person? You don't. Mm-hmm. With girls, a lot of communication is about indirect communication where you imply something. So. What do you do for fun is a question about, you know, how, what is your life like? What is your personality like? And you can't directly say things like, I'm an amazing guy. 
So if you say things like, I'm into trekking, well, then you're saying I'm adventurous. I'm into boxing. Well, you like combat sports, you're masculine. I, I'm into learning many languages. That means you're intelligent. It's about communicating, you know, positive qualities indirectly. If you say, I watch Netflix, you're basically saying I'm boring. Mm. With girls, it's always about subtext. It's always about, you know, what is she going to analyze from this? Girls like to psychoanalyze. They're going to sit at home and be spend five minutes, 70, you know, maybe an hour thinking about everything you said, processing it and trying to get maximum information out of it. Mm-hmm. So with girls, it's always about subtext. You are you cannot directly say a lot of things. Because if a guy comes to you and says, Hey, I'm a very cool guy, well, cool people aren't saying that, right? So you have to <laughs> be indirect. Do you consider yourself a good texter? I do not text that much, but I, I would say so, yes. Yeah. Because I know certain people have great personalities offline, but with text, they struggle. And you know how some guys, they don't take fashion seriously? A lot of folks don't take text seriously. They're like, well, who cares about how I text? Wait till they meet me in real life. But a lot of folks are not going to meet you in real life if your text game is boring. Just have a VA do the texting for you. Take life easy. Texting is a waste of time. You outsource that? No comments, but... <laughs> If you have a female <laughs> VA, she can do texting very easily, very well. Well, what happens when you meet with the person and she asks you questions that you read the text talk about you go. <laughs> <laughs> Man, the the life of dating from a very from a millionaire. You I'm are not right, even though, joking. It's a texting, waste of time. Text, texting, texting, waste of time. texting gets it can easily be a time crunch. For me, bro, if you're going to be texting me, you better get ready for something. I'm not going to be texting you throughout the day. I will text you in the morning and at night. That is all. Um, And if you pass a certain filter, I'll text you a little bit more. But for the most part, I'm not going to be texting you like that. Do you do FaceTimes? No, man. Are you crazy? Never let a girl do FaceTimes or video calls with you. They make a habit out of it. And then if you're Mm. doing something else, let's say you're out on a different date or you're doing anything, they will FaceTime you at the most inconvenient time (laughs) possible. (laughs) I never pick up any video calls. Oh, So you get the video calls though? All girls try it, right? They want to FaceTime you or, you know, call you on WhatsApp with video. Just give me a regular call if you want to talk to me. We're not doing voice, you know, video calls. Girls will make a habit. Not particularly i typically use these media things as a setup base you know let's meet x place y time i care about my time okay and you're not texting throughout the day you've outsourced that allegedly uh calls not much of your thing and facetime is a definite no-no see what are you trying to get out of dating well as guys there's not much we only try to get out a few things. Maybe if you like the girl, something more. And girls, they they like social interaction quite a bit. It fulfills them a lot. They want to talk all day. As a guy, it's just a waste of your time. So what mm. do you want to do? You want to use all these technologies to set up dates. You don't want to spend hours of your day texting. They're getting you leads. Is that how yeah. you're framing it? You use sales analogies for me, my friend. See... At the end of the day, it has to serve you. You don't have to serve the girl or your phone or what have you. Use it to get you the date. You know, this place, this time, let's meet up. I don't know why you're talking about feelings and shit like on the phone. That's going to eat up two hours of your day without you even realizing it. Oh, yeah, man. You want to meet really quick. Um, Have you been catfished before? One time where the picture was cute, but the girl was fat. Not such bullshit. She was using a five or six year old photograph. Have you catfished before? No. Have you heard of hatfished? What's that? It's like when the guy doesn't really have hair, but he tries to make it look like he has hair. <laughs> <laughs> then there's heightfished, where the guy, this is the stupidest thing you could do. Where a guy will say he's 5'10, 
when he's really five foot four. He's like, well, let me just Whoa, get the okay. date and then she'll see and then she'll know my personality at least. It's a dumb thing, man. Uh, so there's different ways to do it. Uh, but I have been catfished before and it's a very annoying thing. Some folks will be very blunt. Like, you do not look like the way that you portrayed yourself. I'm out of here. But other times, uh, someone's like, all right, well, I'm here. Let me just enjoy it. And then I'll leave. I'll enjoy the coffee or whatever. Then I'll leave. So there's two strategies with it. But getting catfished is not a good look. Man, being five four, that must suck. Five four. Do you have short friends? I, I used to know a couple of guys who were short, but man, I know this one short guy who's so funny, dude. Like he's so well read, he's so skilled, he is a philosopher and everything. But a lot of the times, he's just being swiped left just because of his height, and he's outraged by this. He'll complain to anyone that is willing to listen. You won't believe it, man. It's the girls just don't understand. <laughs> and it's he just dwells on it way too much, man. It's like, see, here is my advice for people who are short. Mm-hmm. Step one, don't talk about your height. Step two, don't, don't talk act about like it. don't act like your height matters. Step three, don't crack self-depreciating jokes about your height. Step four, work on the factors that you can't control, like your personality, money, status, what have you. And mm-hmm. step five is step one again. Don't talk about your height. If you yeah, don't, don't bring it up, mm-hmm. you, you'll be fine. Yeah, don't be bringing up your deficit so much. You're going to feel bad. And now the girl who maybe wasn't even thinking about that is going to say, oh, man, maybe I should think about that. I've noticed guys with turbans do that too. Like a lot of chic guys, they'll get the date and then they'll keep saying, the turban doesn't bother you, does it? You know, I could t- kind of tell it'll bother you down the line, right? Dude, if she accepted the date, there is something there. Quit shooting yourself in the foot. Never tell the no. You know, th- this is a sales thing. And it's something I kind of learned over time. But always let the client reject you. Never do the rejection yourself. Never be like, oh, this is gonna, this, this person is going to say no to me because of XYZ. Reason. Like, they, let them say the no. Pitch your yeah. stuff to them. Shut up. Ask for your money. If they don't want it, they'll say no. Yeah. And we were taught this in public speaking as well, where a lot of guys, they get on stage and they'll say, I didn't prepare at all. Let's just see how this goes. Or they'll say, oh my God, I'm so nervous. Let's see how this goes. It's like, why would you start off like that? Do not even bring any awareness to that at all. Just begin your talk. And another- Asking for forgiveness. And if this sucks, then this is why, you know, it's not me that was bad. I just didn't prepare. Yeah, man, it's it's not a good look. So you you don't want to, I mean, we've talked about fake it till you make it before, but you really want to carry yourself like a winner from the get-go. And one easy way to do this is to fix up your posture. A lot of guys, they just walk like losers. In Toastmasters, for example, when you're getting called on stage, Harsh, they're, the audience is supposed to clap for you till you get on stage. So if it takes you five seconds to get on stage, the audience will clap for five seconds. If it takes you five minutes to get on stage, the audience will still clap for five minutes. The reason that we do this is because, number one, it just keeps you encouraged. But number two, it's going to alert you if you're dragging your feet. If the audience is clapping like this for a long time, that's not a good thing. That means you're walking too slow. And in Toastmasters, Man, you can I control an entire audience like that. Taking 15 minutes to walk to the stage. Yeah. Just clap but... for me, you bitches. Yeah, you could troll. But some guys, man, that's just how they walk. And I looked at them. I said, this is how you walk? You walk like a loser, dude. You got to walk like, like, imagine, uh, do you watch fighting? Like cage fighting? UFC? I've seen some clips of it on Twitter. These guys, I've, when they see, walk. It's a particular clip with some chicks showing her tits. Oh, yeah, that, that was recent. Um, <laughs> these guys, when they walk um, to the cage, they train with uh, for that with their coach. The coach doesn't only make them train like what they're going to do in the fight they train the walk too so when you see them they're walking intense that increases the likelihood of them actually winning the fight because they're carrying themselves like a winner so you got to do the same thing with public speaking i see these guys that are walking like "Mm -hmm." mopey it's like come on bro no wonder you're nervous you can't always control the mind but you could always control the body so 
if you're nervous, rather than shouting all these little affirmations in your mind, fix your body language. There have been studies which show that if you have good body language for some time, say before an interview or what have you, open body language, your testosterone levels actually increase. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how true they are, but there was a TED talk where I saw that. Seems interesting. I'll give you two right now. Smirk or raise your chin. These two Don't automatically. Don't tell my boxing coach that. Oh yeah, now for <laughs> fighting, folks. But if you raise your chin in a debate, in a high stress situation, in a date, you will feel a lot better. Um, you'll see Trump do that a lot in these debates. He'll just keep raising his chin because you could tell he's How nervous. How is Trump doing? It's been a while since you've heard of that guy. So he's running for president again. Um, oh, he is. Is he going to? Yeah, is he going to win? I don't know. Uh, right now, a lot of people are running. There's actually an Indian guy running too, Vivek Ramaswamy. We're taking over the world, Arban. He's running for the Republican Party. That's which side is the Republican Party? Uh, like the more conservative side, uh, because there was actually another Indian that ran. I believe last year, and he got roasted, man. Uh, his name was Bobby Jindal. Um, They just said he acted too white. Uh, one of the, the after his debate performance, they started to make Bobby Jindal jokes on how white he is. One of the funniest ones was Bobby Jindal doesn't call it biryani; he calls it casserole. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, man. If the guy grew up in the U.S. and he's gonna be white, too, right? Yeah, no, no, no. I agree with that. It's just like a lot of the Indians were expecting him to carry himself a little bit more. Yeah. I think the line that really became controversial for his campaign, at least, was I think he said, I'm not Indian, I'm American. And I think that bugged a lot of Indian voters. And that's when the whole jokes started to come up. Uh, And that destroyed his campaign, dude. Because nowadays, if you become a meme, that could either help you or just destroy your campaign. And that's what this ultimately destroyed his campaign because we only knew him as the Bobby Jindal jokes at this point. I don't know, man. Now that you mentioned the whole Trump thing again, would you vote for Trump? The like last time the guy was all about, I'm going to build a wall and he never built that wall. So like, dude, the one thing people voted for you was that wall. Yeah, I mean, Trump, I mean, he's not someone I take seriously like that. And I have to actually take in the other candidates because this time a lot more people are running. Uh, there's that Rob Kennedy guy that's running. Uh, Trump's vice president, Mike Pence is running. Chris Christie. Um, and your boy, Joe, Joe Biden is running again. So oh, he uh, is. He's running. running. He can still yeah. run. <laughs> yeah. I would like an uncensored debate where this guy does not have a teleprompter or anything in his ear telling him what to say. Just the organic Joe Biden versus the organic Donald Trump. And let them have a go at it. I don't like either of these candidates, but it seems to me like the first one, Joe Biden guy, seems to have some form of dementia or something where he's not able to communicate properly because of his age or what have you. And Donald Trump just says the funniest shit. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, bro, this is entertainment. And this isn't something that at this point is like, wow, we're going to get policies out of this. It's for entertainment at this point. Certain things are going to actually apply to your day-to-day life. But for the most part, these guys nowadays are, um, they're clowns. Remember, we had this debate a while back about who is a clown, who is not. These guys are now being vetted for clown-like tendencies like can you make people laugh at will can you um can you tear someone down oh no you can't only policies no man we don't need you as president go do something else so to be president nowadays it's it's such an an entertainment position that sucks doesn't it yeah man it sucks but my thing is bro at this stage dude focus on you should not be having that many political opinions if you're broke because now you're going to be a broke guy with a lot of opinions you should be building resources to a point where you actually understand how to think 
And then you need to work on your communication skills so people understand how you think. You'll be shocked by how many people know how to think, but they don't know how to speak. So they, they just are smart in their mind. But you need to be able to speak. You need to be able to think. You need to be able to have a lot of money. Then you should be caring more about politics. But I see a lot of these broke dudes getting so obsessed with politics. It's like, what are you doing, bro? Like, I have an opinion. I'm raising awareness. It's like, nah, you're not, you're not doing anything, dude. You got to do something more practical. You know, if you are somewhat well-versed with politics, and I am not at all, you can make a lot of money with it. You could sell products like this. You know, I support Donald Trump written on a t-shirt and a surprisingly high number of people will pay for that. A lot of products can mm -hmm. be sold in the name of politics. A lot of them, like hats with, you know, some politicians' names or what have you. People pay for this shit. Yeah. Take the money. Yeah. You know how Bollywood has that, those super fans? Yes, the retards. Pol politics has that as well. It was funny because I'm, you know how big, I know you don't watch the Bollywood movies that much, but you know how, I don't know if you've ever seen posters, like they look so big on these posters and movies. Uh, I met some of them, bro, I've... and they're like, they're not that big. Yeah, they enhance them with Photoshop. They make them look bigger, smarter. Like a lot of them, their Bollywood, their bodyguards are much bigger than them. Right. Which is fine, you know. The guy isn't supposed to be taking like copious amounts of steroids. But still, the posters make them look better. Anyway, yeah, Arman, man. I have to get going. Got to get some dinner. Okay. Do you want to answer the questions or do you want to answer them next episode? Let's answer the next episode. This one has become extremely long. Okay. All right, then, brothers. We'll see you guys in two weeks and have a great day. All right. Take care.